I'm a 27-year-old female, and this happened six months ago. I used to be a skeptic up until the experience I've had while babysitting. You see, I've been babysitting three children, Tracy, who's 10, Mike, eight, and Sally, four, ever since Sally was a few months old. I've never really had hard times with them, other than a few tantrums here and there, which is normal. Overall, these children are like if they were my own. So the other day, their mother called me to babysit for them again, but this time it was going to be for six days while she and her husband were on a business trip. The first three nights, everything went normal, up until the fourth. The children and I were watching cartoons until it was time for them to go to bed. Sally was the most difficult to tuck into bed since she was younger and had the most energy. All three children slept in the same bedroom since Mike's bedroom was being remodeled. When I finally got Sally to sleep, I went downstairs to watch my TV show when I heard Sally's ABC toy. The toy had letters as buttons where toddlers can learn them. I instantly thought that Sally had come downstairs to play. Annoyed, I got up from the couch and went upstairs, opened the bedroom door, only to see that all three were fast asleep. Keep in mind, there were no toys on the floor. I checked inside the closet where all the toys were kept. I'd kept looking for that specific toy, but couldn't find it, which made no sense. I clearly heard it up there. Suddenly, I heard the toy downstairs. There's this button on the toy that says, ABC, come sing with me, and a giggle at the end. That's exactly what I heard. My stomach dropped to the point where I just froze in shock and with confusion. I knew for a fact that Sally did not bring it downstairs from either day. I quietly went downstairs to later find that the toy was on the dining room table. I froze again. It was definitely not there before. When I got near the toy, I noticed that it was off. But it said again, ABC, come sing with me. I yelped, got the toy and removed the batteries. Tracy called out my name from the top of the stairs and asked what was the matter. I didn't want to scare her, so I said, Nothing, go back to bed. I didn't know what to make of this, so I placed the batteries in a drawer and went to check on the children. Tracy sat up from her bed when she saw me. I sat next to her and told her everything was okay. Liar, you're scared, she said. I made a puzzled look and said, I just had a bad dream, that's all. She slowly shook her head. Sebastian scared you. Who's Sebastian? I asked. She later laid down facing the wall. Don't let him scare you, Darlene. He just wants to play with Sally's toy. I was so confused yet scared. I didn't want to ask her any more questions. I couldn't sleep that night. Did Tracy also hear the toy? Is she really used to it? The following night, I was able to fall asleep since nothing unusual occurred until four in the morning. I heard whispers outside my door. It was still dark out, and I rubbed my eyes to go check out the noise. It was coming from the children's room that was across from mine. I slowly opened their door and saw Tracy sitting on the rug. She looked at me with a surprised look on her face. What are you doing up? I asked. Nothing she replied. Go to bed. It's too early to be up. Who are you even talking to? Tracy just stared at me with a blank expression. I heard you, Tracy. I know you were talking. Sebastian's upset that you don't give him the same attention you give us. He keeps trying to catch your attention so you can take care of him too. All the hairs on my body stood up. Tracy, please go to bed. We'll talk about this later. No. Sebastian wants your attention now and wants you to understand that. She said that in a louder tone. By this point, Mike and Sally woke up. Tracy, Sebastian has to leave you alone, Mike groaned. So all of you know about Sebastian, I asked. They all nodded. 
Thankfully, their parents were coming back that day because I wanted to get out of there. Fast forward to an hour before their arrival. Tracy didn't want to eat the sandwich I made for her. Mike and Sally had no problem and were playing out in their backyard once they were finished. Tracy, you've been sitting there without touching your food for an hour. Keep in mind the entire time I've been ignoring her since children do that to catch attention. But by this point I was getting irritated. Tracy then looked at me and said, Where's Sebastian's meal? I tried to play along. Where's Sebastian right now? He's holding onto your leg. Giggling. My body froze. Just imagine that made my stomach turn. I tried to remain calm and positive. Well, Sebastian, if you don't sit down, I won't make you a sandwich. Tracy smiles while looking down at where I was standing. I was really hoping for her parents to get here very soon. I made the extra sandwich and placed it where Tracy said he was sitting. He said thank you, she said. I don't know why that made me feel a bit better. Eventually, her parents arrived, and once they settled their things and greeted us, the mum looked at the untouched sandwich and smiled, asking why it was there. Tracy and the other children were already outside with their father playing by this point. I lowered my voice and said, The kids claim there's a boy here wanting my attention. Her eyes widened. Sebastian, please don't tell me this is true. She sat me down on the couch and told me to tell her everything that happened. When I told her about the toy, she recalled it happening every other night, but they've gotten used to it over the years. I don't know how they managed to do that, honestly. Later, she ended up explaining that the family who lived there before them had a four-year-old son who passed away in the house. The family moved out soon after. By the time this family moved in, Tracy was a newborn baby. When she became a toddler, the mother noticed that Tracy would talk to herself, and as she grew older and was able to express herself a little more, she would say Sebastian was sad and always wanted to play, especially at night. The mum naturally thought it was an imaginary friend, but as a day would pass, Tracy would make it look realistic, and someone was actually there. She recalled hearing her argue with literally no one, and how one of the toys went missing, then later appeared in the locked shed they have in the backyard. It was impossible for Tracy to put it through there. This creeped the parents out that they decided to look up their house's history in the hopes of finding that nothing tragic had occurred, when in fact, it did. They realized a little boy had passed away with not too much information on it. This was devastating to them. They decided that they had to deal with it since the little boy wasn't harming anyone. It was also clear that only Tracy could communicate with Sebastian. Neither Mike nor Sally could. But they grew up knowing that Tracy had a friend. When they noticed Tracy staying up later at night playing and talking, they simply know the routine of telling her to stop and to tell Sebastian it's time for bed. The mother said, Darlene, honey, Tracy had already told me about Sebastian liking you ever since you started babysitting them. But I told her not to tell you anything because it may startle you or you wouldn't believe her. But now you see that Sebastian desperately wants to catch your attention. He's a good kid. It would destroy all of us to see you leave and no longer babysit for this family. If that's what you end up deciding, that's understandable. In reality, Sebastian didn't do any harm. It actually made me feel bad for him. Of course, this happened unexpectedly. And for four years of babysitting these children, I'd never experienced such a thing. Maybe Sebastian did want attention after so long. Besides, I couldn't leave my babies. As stated earlier, I see them as my own, so I decided to keep babysitting them. After that experience, I babysat two more times. Nothing extraordinary happened, other than having some misplaced stuff appear out of nowhere. I've slowly gotten used to it, but it's not quite as easy. I didn't used to believe in the paranormal, but you have to experience it for it to change your mind completely, as it did with me. We have a full-length mirror in our bedroom that my wife will sit in front of when she's getting ready to go out. She sits down and puts on her makeup and sometimes will listen to music. It's angled in such a way that I can see her in the reflection in our bathroom mirror as I come out of the shower. 
I see the reflection in the bathroom mirror off the reflection of the full length mirror. Now a few years ago we were getting ready to go out and I forgot a towel. I knew that she had washed all the towels and I forgot to put one on the dryer before getting in the shower. So when my shower was done I pulled back the shower curtain and saw her in the reflection that I was describing. Babe, can you get me a towel? Now her back's to the bathroom, but I see her look up in the mirror and just stare at me. Doesn't say a blank thing, just stares. Babe, nothing. No response but that stare. I figured she was mad I didn't grab a towel. So I walk out the bathroom, wet and naked, and head downstairs to our first floor laundry room which is on the other side of the kitchen. As I cross into the laundry room, I literally bump into my wife coming out of the laundry. Totally scared the crap out of me. Why are you running through the house naked? I would have got you a towel. I can't remember my exact words, but it was along the lines of, I didn't think you heard me. So I slowly walked back upstairs and slowly peered into the bedroom, half expecting some ghost to jump out at me but there was nothing. No one in front of the mirror and no one in the bathroom. I know it sounds fake as hell, but it is 100% what I saw. November 13th, 2011 is when my mum went crazy. My parents were married for 21 years. My mum had always had her demons, but for a long time she at least tried. Sometime in 2006, after I went off for college, she went off her meds for depression. This time was different, though. I didn't realise what mania looked like at the time, as I was only 18, but years later, realised she had an adult onset of bipolar disorder, which was unnerving. It was the last straw for my dad, her not taking her meds anymore for the I don't even know how many at the time, and the divorce was finalised in 2008. My mum was never the same. The combination of borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder, both diagnosed, meant watching her go up and down on a haunting roller coaster of destruction, meant watching the small part of her that was my mother fade away. My dad left her the house, the only one we had lived in all my life. It's a beautiful home, cosy, and on the corner, there's a big bay window and natural light. It always felt like home until the divorce. I hated being in the house after my dad left. Her behaviour became more erratic, and the lows became so much lower, and the house began to change. It was dark and stale, and you couldn't wait to leave. I've always chalked it up to my perception as a young adult weathering a divorce, and my mum's downward spiral. But now I don't know. It got worse and worse over time, and then I got a phone call on November 13th, 2011. I was living in another city. The call was from my father telling me a neighbour noticed he hadn't seen my dog in the bay window for several days and decided to use the spare key my mother had given him. The dog was found dead in the bathroom and my mother in bed weak and frail. She had laid in the bed for so long her muscles had atrophied. The dog I'd never been able to get answers on but my sister once let slip that there was some blood. The cleaners my aunt hired to clean the house found my cat three days into the job, crushed to death between the ottoman and the chair in the back room. She spent the next few years in a catatonic state, first in the mental hospital and then transferred to a nursing home. In the meantime, I was the one to clean up the house. She was a shopaholic hoarder and mental illness had only amplified it. The first time I came home, it felt dark and stale, but it was empty. It didn't have the panicked pressure that I had felt when my mother was there. I sorted and cleaned, sorted and cleaned, and the more I did it, the lighter and brighter it became, until it felt like home again. Not really, but kind of. There was always a little bit of staleness there, but I attributed it, and perhaps still do, to my subconscious awareness of what had happened. One thing I noticed about the house was that the lightness could become dark in the blink of an eye, and everything was gradual, if that makes sense. You never noticed things until it was consumed by the stale darkness. It was like a cloak coming over the place in one steady sweep. It was odd. I had a boyfriend. Our relationship wasn't exactly healthy to begin with, but I will say that he noticed the same things I did with the house. 
There were three specific incidents that I want to discuss. The first was one day when it was him and me and one of his friends sitting in the middle room when we heard the distinct sound of the front door opening. They went to check and it was closed with no sign of being opened. The thing about the door is that as it was old like the rest of the house, the door had become difficult to open and close. In order to open it, you had to put your shoulder into it, but in order to close it, you had to thrust your body weight against it several times before it would shut. We heard it open. We never heard it shut. This was impossible, and three people heard the exact same thing. The second incident, my ex and I were sitting in the middle room once again. We were in our office chairs at our desk talking about something when we distinctly heard several creaks overhead and a sudden smash directly, and I mean directly, over my head in the attic. It was as if someone took several steps up until they were overhead, and either a plate or glass bong, that very specific shattering sound, and threw it with great force to the floor. The sound was so incredibly clear, and we both heard it. My ex and I locked eyes with each other and whispered, There's someone in the attic. I was gone. I bolted out to the garage and backed my car out and parked in the driveway. My ex came out to meet me and convinced me to stare where I was in the car, as he called his best friend, the one who heard the front door open and not close. I asked him to come with the gun so that they could search the attic. His best friend arrived in two minutes with the firearm, they both went inside the house and searched the place from top to bottom as I sat in the driveway. The way this house was set up was that it was on a corner lot. The side gate faced the street and there was a bay window that wrapped around the house and stretched almost to the front door. We still had the blinds pulled up. This meant that from my vantage point I could see inside half of the house and if anyone exited through the only two exits in the home, the front door and side gate, I could even see the back fence from where I was. I would see them. I could even see the roof. It was not a large home. I would be able to see if anyone was trying to make an escape. As I waited for the boys to return, I half expected to see a homeless man scramble out of the house. It was only that that could explain the sound of something being thrown right above my head. The boys completed the search of the home. Nothing and no one was found. I asked if they had checked the attic. Thoroughly, they replied, and I believed them. The thing about the attic of the house is that it wasn't really a true attic. The rafters were set up in such a way that a person could not walk around freely up there, and if they did, they would fall through the ceiling. There was a light switch up there, and the boys had exclaimed, every inch of the attic was searched, and not a sign of life had been found. No glass, nothing. It would be easy to write it off as strange sounds of the old house, if it wasn't for one thing. My boyfriend was insistent that he heard footsteps leading up to the crash. He was adamant he heard them, as they were apparently walked on the spot right above my head. He had also heard the wood slightly creak, as if something had lifted its arms up to throw something with force. I wear hearing aids, so I miss out on a lot of small details in regards to sound but I even heard the creaking before the smash, and I know by then when my boyfriend was being sincere. I believe him, even to this day. The third incident, we were in the house for two or three years. I split my time between there and down south for college. My boyfriend stayed behind in the house. He would mention that there were times he just knew he wasn't alone, but no other specific incidents took place. The house began to feel darker, our fights grew worse and more violent. Something happened to my mind. It all happened gradually, until it was horrible, the point of no return. To this day, the depression felt like nothing I had ever experienced and it changed me. After one particular savage fight, I went for a drive and came back. I was alone, he wasn't there. I entered through the back door and was greeted by a wall of darkness. It was stale, cold, dark. Even though the lights were on, you could barely breathe. I snapped, and I yelled out into the darkness of the kitchen, Get out! Go away! I see you and I'm sick of you! It retreated. I swear to you on my son, I visibly saw the darkness 
shift backwards. I screamed as it moved some more, and it retreated more, and then there was light again. My memory stops there, in the kitchen screaming at the darkness. Then I woke up in my bed fully clothed on top of the sheets. The house was dark again. There was the staleness, but then when I walked into the kitchen it was light and bright. Oddly enough, that was the first time I considered the possibility there might be something more to the house, that there might be something otherworldly there. But what? Not too long after the kitchen incident, I left the house and put it up for sale. I have been through many tough and trying times since then, but I've never experienced the darkness, the sluggishness, the staleness, the pressure, the panic, the hopeless and bleakness and agony of a home like that since. My gut tells me there's something there. My rationalism is willing to conclude that it could all be subconsciously rooted in the pain associated with the home's history. But I feel there truly is, or was, something dark and dangerous in that home. And I only wonder if it was there when my mother moved in with my father, or if perhaps she created or invited it in with her downward spiral. I had a recurring dream while in the house, and I would walk into the middle room and see something that resembled a cross between the creature from Alien and Predator. It would lock eyes with me, and I would hear in my mind, Widow Sullivan, and the dream would end. There is no one in my family with the name Sullivan, and I'm unsure if it's connected, but probably not. I've never had the dream again after leaving the home. Let me take you back in time to Birmingham, 1998, where I lived in a two split into three bedroom semi-detached council house. The first part of the story, after recent research, could have well been a sleep paralysis episode, but I guess I'll let you make your own mind to see if that assumption is correct or not. I was around eight at the time, and I woke up in the middle of the night. When I did, I felt a long nail scratch me all the way down my scalp. It came from behind my bed. I still to this day can't sleep without that gap being covered. I would frequently wake up underneath the bed in the middle of the night. One time I remember waking up, being almost locked behind the headrest, sitting up. Once again, I must have been doing this in my sleep. Other things happened like hearing faint whispers in my ear when in bed, the sensation of being watched, and hearing footsteps come up and down the stairs. One time I remember seeing both of my dogs bark and growl at the ceiling, watching it go around the room, but there was nothing there that I could see. My parents and brother didn't take any notice. Perhaps it was because I was inquisitive or attracted to this kind of phenomena. Now, Going to where I was 15, there was a girl who was obsessed with me at school. She would stalk me and hang around outside my house. She was that bad that she jumped off a bridge because I wasn't interested. Fortunately, she got caught by a friend underneath, as it was only a 20-foot drop, and seems to be doing well for herself now. Well, one night, my phone was non-stop ringing, from midnight until 2 or 3 a.m. until my battery ran out. My screen started lighting up my room like a kaleidoscope with magnificent rainbow colours. This went on for 10 minutes and totally freaked me out. Once again, this is probably something that has a logical explanation. Now, it's 2004. GTA has just been released and I'm about 15 years old and it's around the same time of the cell phone incident. I would go to school to sign my name in the register, then truant for the rest of the day, as my parents worked and I knew I would have a free house. I go to my brother's room to play the game, shut the door as this door had no lock on it, and it was a standard wooden door with a handle. Fast forward to when I needed to leave the room, and the door was jammed from the inside. It wouldn't open at all. Outside this bedroom window there is a porch, which I could gain access to by climbing out of the bedroom window and then climbing down from there to the outside floor. I decided to do this and then went back to school for the last hour or so. Crazy to think I got away with this in 2005. 
After school, I walked back home with my younger brother, and my dad's at home. I explained that I had a problem with the door and it wouldn't open. My dad proceeds to open it without any issue, and it continues to open and close for the rest of the day. Now to day two. I decide to do the same thing, play truant so that I can play GTA. The exact same thing happens once again. I climbed out the window and onto the porch. This time I decided to go back inside my home. The volume of the TV was playing as normal, with some BBC show, but the screen was paused on something completely unrelated. On the screen was a picture of an old lady. It had a white background and she was staring at me. The best way to describe it is a portrait picture like a photo. There's no way this could have been any TV show that had been on. She had black eyes and didn't seem to have any life in her. From then, I never really had any experiences in the house, other than the occasional strange noises and some weird stuff that I brushed off. Looking back, if it really was a ghost, I feel like it attached itself to me, and I don't know why. On the night of the 9th of April at 4am, a sense of normalcy pervaded the house. It was just another dreary evening in Washington State. My girlfriend had retired to bed a few hours earlier, leaving me alone in the living room, engrossed in a show which she had recommended. As the pilot episode played on, I found myself comfortably seated on the couch, facing the television and the slightly ajar curtains that led into the room. The ambience was calm, and I thoroughly enjoyed the Netflix series. Then, in an instant, everything was changed. My gaze was abruptly torn away from the television screen, drawn to a movement beyond the curtains. Through the narrow four-inch gap, I discerned the silhouette of a dark, shifting shadow. It took only a moment for my mind to register the figure's resemblance to the infamous old hag of folklore, a crone-like entity often associated with sleep paralysis. The shadowy figure mirrored the old hag's appearance, an elderly woman with a prominent nose reminiscent of the wicked witch from Snow White, sans the iconic hat. However, this time, it wasn't a fleeting image during sleep paralysis. It was a tangible presence lingering outside my living room. I fixated on the sight, observing the shadow for approximately five seconds as it slithered away from the living room and vanished into the adjacent laundry room. Confusion and disbelief engulfed me, desperately searching for a rational explanation. Perhaps it was a trick of the mind, an illusion conjured by my imagination. I sat in silence on the couch, straining my ears for any sign of movement within the house. But the stillness remained unbroken, determined to uncover the truth. I cautiously emerged from the living room, drawing the curtain aside and turning right to enter the laundry room. To my surprise, the room was vacant. No trace of the shadowy figure remained. I cast a doubtful glance at the locked and secure garage door, questioning the impossibility of it all. Leaving the laundry room, I hastened my steps and ascended the stairs, anxious to check on my girlfriend in our master bedroom. Given her occasional bouts of sleep paralysis, my mind raced with concern as I reached the top step. I swung open the door, revealing my girlfriend comfortably reclining in bed absorbed in her tablet. Realizing she was awake and not wanting to alarm her with the unsettling encounter I had just experienced downstairs, I grasped for a casual remark, alerting out, uh, Do you want to smoke? She declined, assuring me that she was fine, and I bid her good night and retreated downstairs. The subsequent hours were consumed by intensive research, a quest to find anyone else who had encounters with such phenomenon outside of the realms of sleep paralysis. However, my search yielded no results, no corroborating stories or sightings of this mysterious figure. Disheartened, but resolved, I decided to put the incident behind me and retire for the night. Upon awakening, I recounted the events of the previous night in full detail to my girlfriend, leaving her visibly unsettled. While it appeared that nothing tangible had infiltrated our home, I am certain that 
something was present, a presence that defied explanation. It is my fervent belief that these entities are real, and people should be aware of their existence. To those who lend an ear, remember this. Encountering the old hag does not require the confines of sleep paralysis, and you never know whose home she may choose to haunt next. If you find yourself witnessing the movements of a shadow tonight, it might be more than just a mere trick of the mind. I've had three paranormal encounters, and I'm interested to see what you make of them. The first was small, so small I thought I had imagined it. I left my room and walked past the bathroom door. I could have sworn I saw a tall figure standing there in the dark. I assumed maybe it was a family member, so I spoke to the figure. As soon as I did, I heard the creak of the front door and the voices of my parents and siblings filled the house. I was confused. Who was it then? I turned back to the figure and it was gone. I decided perhaps I'd just been half asleep, and I never spoke to anyone about it. That was months ago. The second encounter was last week. I was sat on the floor of my kitchen with my dog, Chase. It was late at night, around midnight, when Chase suddenly got irritated and was staring at the doorway, confused. I turned around and met a pair of eyes in the doorway. It looked exactly like my sister, She's only nine, so I assumed she needed a snack or some water. So I asked her, What do you need, moles? And she whispered, Nothing, and kind of hovered away. I got my feet and followed her. I was maybe three steps behind, not far at all, where I rounded the corner she had just gone into and was met with nothing. It was a long hallway and she couldn't have gotten away that fast, especially not that quietly. I felt in that moment like I was going crazy. And I messaged my mum and asked her if Molly had entered her room, and she said that she had about 10 minutes ago. I was perplexed, and asked if she was sure she hadn't just entered, and she told me that she had been there for a good amount of time. And when she had left, she'd only gone to get her water from the hallway, which is only a few steps from the door. She wouldn't have even come near me. It couldn't have been my sister. This final encounter was last night, at midnight. I got out of bed realizing I had forgotten to feed my animals. I had just given them their food in the kitchen, made sure they were all there before I went up the stairs, and I walked to the fourth floor to get a book from the library. As soon as I reached the top of the step, the door right across from the stairs opened slowly. I just ran, all the way down the stairs and into my room. I locked the door and tried to make sense of it all. I blamed the draft last night, but a draft cannot turn a doorknob. Can someone please tell me what's happening? I'm terrified. It's not the first house this happened at. At my old residence, I had friends who would refuse to come over a second time. They all claimed to have seen things. I never understood and do now. I don't want to live here either. I have an outside entertainment system that I use a lot during the summer. It's a large projection screen and some outdoor furniture. We use a projector to watch movies late into the night and during the summer. My 15 year old son and I were out there watching a movie one night. It was around two or three AM. Suddenly I hear a click noise. It sounds like the electricity clicking on and off. It also sounds a bit like the snapping of a fire. I lived on a farm with miles of acreage so I started to get worried that a fire had started. I paused our movie and listened. My son quickly whispered, I hear it too. I always bring a flashlight out there with us. I picked it up and it's a Robbie shop flashlight, so it's very bright. I shined it out onto the open field behind us, but I couldn't see anything, but I could still hear the noise. Suddenly I was frozen. I was shining the flashlight out onto the field, but I wasn't like the beam of light stopped maybe 10 feet away. It was like the light was reflecting back at me and it hit something which I couldn't see. I moved the flashlight to the side and the beam spread over the ground like it should have. My son, who was afraid of nothing, started to panic and that scared me. I mean, this kid isn't afraid of anything. He loves true crime and missing people stuff 
and has never had nightmares because of them. He's never been afraid of the dark, so the fact that he was scared frightened me. It's a glimmering man, he says. Mum, we have to get out of here now. I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm into the supernatural, but I've never heard of that one. I escorted him back into the house and then went to collect our projector and other items we left out there. I couldn't leave that stuff out there. The noise had stopped by the time I got back there and I wasn't so scared. I collected everything and decided to take another look. I needed to make sure a fire hadn't started. I shined the flashlight around and suddenly the beam was blocked and then unblocked. It was like something had run through the beam of light. I was terrified at that point, so I ran into the house and I looked up accounts of the Glimmer Man, and it seems like what I saw. A few years back, me and some friends were at our friend's house watching TV. My friend had decided to go ahead and charge her phone, and then out of nowhere her charger gets thrown out of her phone and down the staircase. The weird thing is, the phone didn't move a centimetre, it was an iPhone charging on an iPhone charger, and if you have the iPhone charger yourself, you know that an iPhone charger won't just slip out, especially not at a speed like that. The charger fell from the sofa and down the staircase at one hell of a speed. When we went to get it, the charger of the tip had been bent. I didn't even think I or anyone else in the room could have thrown a charger at that speed down the staircase to the point where the tip bent. After it got thrown down, her dog started acting like crazy. It started barking going upstairs and then came down whining. It seemed hella stressed and it went on for 15 minutes. I don't understand how charges randomly fly down the stairs. My friend who lived there also claimed she'd heard stuff. But me personally, I don't really believe in the paranormal. But this just doesn't sit right with me. What do you think? I grew up in Germany and have had a few things that I can't explain happen. Allow me to elaborate. I had a visit from my great-grandfather, who I didn't even get to meet. This was in my dreams. He passed away years before I was born. I can remember what he looked like, but not what he said to me. But he gave me a warning. I later found out it was my great-grandfather after seeing pictures of him for the first time in my life. My grandmother removed all pictures of him after he passed from cancer and stored them in the attic, which she ended up clearing out a decade and a half after. I also experienced a shadow person imitating my mum and standing in the doorway to my bedroom, calling for me. I turned around and mumbled to that thing to leave me alone, believing it to be my mum. The living room was next door, and my mum heard me mumbling, so she asked if I was okay and I answered, Hey, why did you wake me? Turns out, she never called for me, and had never stood in the doorway, and she hadn't seen or heard a thing, nor called out to me. Another time was when my grandma called me on the phone. She has a sixth sense when it comes to her family, and told me that everything was going to be okay. No hi or how are you. At the time I was feeling very sad, and didn't really know what I was going to do with myself and my life. I have no idea what happened or why she called me, but it felt as if she knew everything I was going through somehow. I'm sure of it. She did that a few times with others like my sister. She'd call her and tell her something related to what was happening in her life and give her advice without being told a thing. The latest experience I have has to do with the Indian side of my family. We had a shrine in our wardrobe for the gods before we moved house. One night, a blue orb danced through the room. The curtains were closed and they didn't let any light through. The orb curiously moved into the wardrobe into the shrine. I told my husband about it and he says I saw a god. No idea if it was the case, but I certainly couldn't explain what I saw that night. Another time we had a solar eclipse. My husband had a necklace he's carried with him since he was a baby. His mum extended it as he grew, and he gave it to me whenever he had to leave for extended periods of time. One day, on the solar eclipse, I suddenly felt really sick. The bus driver noticed because I turned as pale as a ghost while driving home, 
and he even offered to call the doctor for me. I declined and had a hard time walking the last meters to the house. When I called my husband to inform him, I had a burning sensation where the necklace touched my skin. So I asked if I could take it off and where to store it properly. He told me to put it in a box, to store it in the furthest corner away from me and to not wear it until he tells me it's okay to wear again. Turns out his father's mistress does black magic and the gods to protect us against black magic are weakest during the solar eclipse. I felt weak until the eclipse passed and started wearing the necklace again without any issues. The last story is when I visited my in-laws house in India. It's a little old, but really comfy and pretty. I always felt uneasy around the staircase. Turns out the most active part of the house was there. My mother-in-law was a little doubtful about me, but she said to my husband that the ghosts were less active during my stay with them and that basically I carried too much light energy for them and I dispel them from the house. Guess that was that. That's my small collection. I don't really know where to go from here. Tell me what you guys think. I was on a Discord call with some of my friends. It was around 10pm and I decided I'd start going about my nightly routine and getting settled in for the night while on the call. I muted myself and went to brush my teeth, got my pillows all set up on my bed and went to close my blinds on the window. That was when I noticed a man standing under the street lamp. I couldn't see his face despite nothing really obscuring it and he was wearing a suit. He wasn't too particularly tall, and I don't know what really stood out about him other than him just being there. I don't know why it gave me such an off feeling. I unmute myself and sit back at my desk, letting my friends know about this and joking around about how maybe his Uber is late or maybe his wife kicked him out. We also gave him the very creative name Suit Man. After a few moments, I go back to the window to see if he's moved. He indeed had moved. He was now standing in front of the across-the-street neighbor's backyard gate. The longer I looked at him, I began to notice a few odd things. First of all, he wasn't facing the gate and was standing completely still. Second of all, I noticed he hadn't triggered the neighbor's floodlight, which came on automatically when someone or something moved nearby. You had to cross over the driveway to get to the gate, which would set the lights off. At this point, I'm a little freaked out, but still intrigued, so I grab my phone and try and take a picture. However, when I turn back to look at where the person was, even though I'd only looked away for a moment, he was gone. Screw this. I closed my blinds and stayed on the voice chat most of the night since I was a little freaked out and didn't want to try to go to sleep anytime soon after that odd encounter. Although this was pretty creepy, the weirdest part came after. For a few months after this, I would hear someone whistling while walking down the street at the exact same time, each and every day. It stopped recently and I haven't heard it since, nor have I seen Soup Man, but I'm hoping that that will be the end of it. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Just a reminder that new content comes out every Tuesday and Thursday with a big compilation on Saturday. Don't forget to download our app for even more stories. And for those of you who have been asking, a new podcast has just launched over on Spotify and other podcasting platforms. And there will be a new one every week released on Wednesdays at the same time. So stay tuned if you are so inclined. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to my members and patrons, and if you'd like your name at the end credits as well as some extra perks for helping support the channel, you can find the links in the description to do that. Thank you all so much for listening. More content can be seen on screen now, but until next time, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.